Welcome everybody to this Facebook Live. My name is Fabio Huitrago. I'm the course director with Roatan Dive Academy. And I'm going to be uh, talking today about um, a course that I find very interesting and uh, with lots of, of knowledge and very useful when you come diving to, uh, to the Caribbean especially because it allows you to understand uh, lots of the ecological processes that happen on those ecosystems that we want to go uh, and, and we visit every time. So um, the course itself is going to allow you to understand what's happening and not only identifying the different species that we enjoy so much, but also understanding why they coexist and who uh, is related to who other species on the ecosystem. So this course is called the Paddy Underwater Naturalist, and I'm going to be describing briefly what is the content of the course. Remember the idea of these workshops is to use the time that we have uh, lockdown to refresh knowledge or to uh, learn a bit more on what these courses are about. So we use the time efficiently as we are quarantined or lockdown. Okay, so um, just a little of, of my background. I am the course director with Roatan Dive Academy, but I'm also an ecologist and I have a master in wildlife conservation. And I've been working for a long time in the uh, management of protected areas, the conservation of threatened species, the control of invasive species. We just did a, a, a Facebook Live last week on the, the lionfish control course that I wrote and Patty has already approved uh, as a way to uh, contribute to the conservation of the ecosystems on the Caribbean where we have these invasive lionfish species um, threatening the conservation of the natural processes and the uh, local biodiversity of the Caribbean. But today we're going to be talking, as I was saying, um, about the Paddy Underwater Naturalist course, uh, which I find as an ecologist a very interesting course. This is not the full content of the course, and this is not to replace proper training, but it's to give you an idea of what the course is about. So maybe the next time you, uh, you come diving to uh, Roatan, uh, you can take this course and you can learn more about the ecosystems that we have in this uh, region of the world. So let's uh, get started with uh, the with the course itself. As I was saying, this is the Paddy Underwater Naturalist course, right? And um, for beginning with this course, I want to say that uh, the course itself has lots of definitions that are very interesting uh, to know. For example, the first one we have here on the screen is what is ecology? Most of the people listen to this word, but they don't truly understand what ecology means. And ecolo ecology comes from the Greek uh, language that means the study of our house, right? So basically, uh, ecology is studying everything that happens with all the organisms, their interactions, and the environment with, where those organisms exist. So basically, we are studying our house. We are studying our home and all the different organisms that coexist in the same space. Uh, this is also something that we get into during the Paddy Underwater Naturalist course because you're going to learn a lot about what is part of our house, what is part of our ecosystem, of our habitat. And as you will see, another definition that we uh, explain and, and use during the course is what is an ecosystem. And in this case, we can, um, we can understand an ecosystem as a group of living organisms and the relationship between themselves, but also with the environment and all the physical attributes that they have in that given space, right? So ecosystem is not only the space or it is, it is not just the, the, the organisms that do not move, that it is a misconception that lots of people may have. An ecosystem is composed of all the living organisms in a given space that interact among each other and also depend or have a relationship with the physical um, environment in which they live, right? So the ecosystem is more than just a species or more than just the uh, physical attributes and geographical attributes of a given uh, place. 
Obviously, we have the environment that can make different changes in, in, in along the year, uh, in time or in space, particularly in the ocean where we have uh, larger depth, we have less lights, we have more pressure, we have maybe less current, we have more nutrients. So there might be different conditions along the year in time, or there might be different conditions also in the same area that can uh, be classified or can produce us to classify those two areas as two different ecosystems coexisting in the same place. For example, we have uh, seagrass and we have coral reefs, right? They are very closely related and some uh, expert might say that they are the same ecosystem or some might just uh, divide them into different ecosystems or what happens with the mangroves, for example, and the seagrass. But this is something... Uh, that uh, it's, it's a discussion on, on the concept of the ecosystem, but what it is important for the people taking this course, for the students taking this course, is that to understand that we're talking about all the living organisms that coexist and interact in a given place, in a given environmental conditions. Right, so another important ecosystem, uh, another important definition is the definition of a community, right? So we have the ecosystem, which is basically the house, which is everything, right, that we have in, in a given place, in a given site. Then we have a community, and the community is the living organisms that interact among each other, right? So here, uh, the, the definition of community takes out all the uh, environment and the physical attributes of the place. And we are just talking, when we talk about a community, we talk about all the living organisms that coexist and interact in the given place. This is also something that we uh, go in depth when we do the, the underwater natural discourse because you want to understand what's a community and what are the members of the community in which you're going to be diving. So you can say, for example, when you go diving in a, in a reef that you can see different species of fish, right? So probably in that same site, all those species of fish and also all the species of corals and all the species of, of, of algae and all the species of invertebrates, for example, that coexist in that area are going to be part of the community, the ecological community, right? So this is something very important to take into consideration to understand that when we go to a site, Right, the richness, the biological richness of a, of a place is not only given by the animals, the organisms that move. There is a large community of organisms that have uh, relationships and in some cases dependencies in uh, different, different ways according to different relationships, right? So one group of e organisms depend on another group of er organisms and this one at the same time depends on another group of organisms. So everything is interconnected and interrelated. Again, I'm saying all these because these are basic concepts that uh, the paddy underwater naturalist should understand to be aware of the different uh, organisms that we see that we watch when we go diving at a given place. And also, it is, it is very useful, and I find this is my personal perspective, right? I find that these kind of definitions and understanding what we're looking at when we go diving is going to make you uh, enjoy more the dives because it is not just like swimming and trying to find the big fish, which is what most of the people will do, but also uh, it will give you a different perspective and a different angle just by realizing that there are many more organisms that interact in the same uh, area, in the same ecosystem, right? So when you start paying attention not only to the little organisms or the large organisms, but also for the interrelationships between all the organisms coexisting in the same place, you will have a very large list of different things to pay attention to and to watch when you're diving. So it is more enjoyable because you have lots of more things that you can discover, that you can learn when you're diving in a given spot. Every time we go diving to even the same place where we dive very often, every time we go diving, we find new things. We find like there was a new algae that is being eaten by a parrotfish, or we find like there is a, a new predator fish that we didn't have before that is eating these kind of uh, little tiny fish, or we found a new shrimp, or there, there was a new crab that was not the previous month or whatever, right? So we just realize that there is more animals that 
make part of this big ecological community that we're talking about. Okay, then we come to the definition of a population. What's a population? And when we talk about a community, we talk about all the living organisms, different species, coexisting in the same place, sharing the same area. But when we get to the definition of a population, we're talking just about the organisms or the individuals of the same species coexisting in that same place, in the same area, right? So um, this is important to say that when we talk about fisheries and fisheries stock and how to um, replenish the stock and lots of terms that you will find like sustainable yield, for example, in terms of fisheries, they are referring only to the population. So uh, what they take into consideration is if the population can reproduce, how fast they reproduce, uh, how fast they reach sexual maturity, so you know how um, often the recruitment of new individuals in the population is going to happen. But they do not take into consideration what's happening with those other populations within the ecological community, within the ecosystem, that are, for example, predators or prey for a given population of an interest. And as we know, the growth of a population depends on how much food they have available or depends also on how much pressure they have from a, another population that might be a population of a predator fish, for example. So if you have a large predator population, that's going to put more pressure on a given fish population. And if you do not have enough food available, that population is going to decrease very easily and fast because of the pressure and the lack of enough food. Right, so this is more an ecological overview that is very interesting to understand when we get to, uh, to go dive into a given site. We are not just talking about uh, animals in a farm that just breathe and reproduce, right? These animals have interactions. They have food, they have predators, they have probably uh, competence with all the different species. So we're talking about different relationships that happen within each of the species, each of the populations within a community in a given ecosystem. I know this might sound like very complicated, but this is just what we talk about during the course. And we try to make uh, the students understand the different perspective of the relationships among the different organisms coexisting in a given ecosystem. Then we get, we get to, we go down to this definition, which is habitat. What is a habitat? So we know the population is all the individuals of the same species, right? That live in a given place. So the habitat is going to be the house, the home where this population lives, right? So we're talking about a specific organisms uh, and a population of that organism and where physically this organism exists. And that would be the habitat. So for example, we cannot say that uh, penguins right? The Arctic penguins live on the Caribbean because it's not their habitat. Or for example, the polar bear cannot be found in tropical waters in the Galapagos, right? So they have different habitats. They have, they are part of different ecosystems. So um, the concept of habitat is very interesting because uh, not only the population have different uh, dependencies, as we were talking before about the prey, uh, the predator fish, the food that they have, but also the habitat has a limited capacity, right? So the habitat is that place in which a group of organisms can exist, but how many uh, fish can we fit in one place? Probably it depends on uh, the geographical features, the physical features, the environment, the availability of food. So those are attributes of the habitat that we need to understand to be able to also understand what's happening with the population. In some cases, maybe uh, some of you have been diving to uh, same areas or same reefs, same locations in, in different moments along the year. And you would realize that you get there in, at a moment of the year and then you come back in a different moment of the year and the population or the, the, the ecosystem has basically changed completely. You find new species you do not see that amount of fish that you saw in the previous trip, right? And this is because there is also like fluctuations along the year, uh, according to the moon, the tides, the wind, the changes on the seasons of, um, and the environmental conditions in each of the seasons of the year. So that is going to also affect what's happening with the habitat, 
what's happening within the ecosystem and all the ecological community and all the populations of the different species that we find in a given site. Okay, so now after all these definitions, right, we get to to uh, the second part of the course is, okay, how do we classify the organisms that we can find on the ecosystems? So here what we have is basically a, uh, a graphic of the different kingdoms in which we can classify the living organisms, right? So we have five in these graphics. Some authors, some uh, scientists may say that there is six because they split the, the monera, the bacteria, in two big groups, the eubacteria and the archaebacteria. But for all the given purposes, for what we, uh, what we have to teach and what you have to learn during this course, um, we, can, we can talk about five kingdoms, right? So we have uh, the fungi, which is basically all the, uh, the fungi, the mushrooms, and uh, many other different species of fungi. And as you can see, that's the largest kingdom that we have in this planet. Basically, there has been 3,800,000 species reported of fungi in the planet. And uh, this is one of the groups, and we have to say it, that has been less studied. So every time there is new studies on the fungi kingdom, we find new species, and this group is, grow is growing a lot and very fast because of the new research that are being done. Obviously, there is also lots of species being lost because of climate change, because of deforestation, because of change in the conditions of the ocean, because of uh, the reduction of humidity or the increase of waterfall in a given area. So this is this uh, is a number that is just a, a way, an indirect way to just realize and compare the numbers of species we have for each of the kingdoms. But obviously, this is not fixed information. It's just to give you an idea of, of how big the kingdoms are. Then we get to animals, right? Animals is one kingdom, Animalia, it's called in Latin. And this uh, kingdom has reported or uh, identified at least one million species. Then we get to plants in which we have 275,000 species. Then protists, which is basically multicellular species. And then you get to bacteria. And as I was saying at the beginning, this kingdom can be split in two, uh, which are basically unicellular organisms uh, that compose the bacteria, the monera kingdom, right? Then after we learn how to classify the organisms in the different kingdoms, we get to the classification of the animals, of the kingdom of animals, right? And here we can see the main phylums, which is the name that we give to that group of organisms that have the same characteristics. For example, we have the uh, phylum porifera, and porifera is basically the phylum in which we integrate all these sponges and porifera means in latin full of pores so basically all the little holes that this colony of organisms that make a sponge have like pores in which they filtrate water that's why the, the film is called porifera right so then we have nidarians in the nidarians film what we have is corals we have jellyfish as well uh, as two let's say, uh, common names given to organisms within this phylum. We also have annelids, which is organisms with rings. Annelids, in, anelli in Latin means ring, right? So uh, ringed animals are the, the ones that go into the annelids phylum. And basically this is worms, right? So we have lots of worms with, within this uh, phylum. Then we have the mollusks that you can see on the lower corner, right there on the on the left of the screen. And on the mollusks, we have shells, we have bivalves, we have uh, gastropods, we have the octopus as well, which are animals, mollusks that do not have a shell, right? So um, those go into the film of the mollusks, and then we have the arthropods. In the arthropods, you have shrimps, lobsters, crabs, and also we would have in land all the insects, for example, just to, to name some of the arthropods that we can include in this uh, film. Then we get to the group of the chordates, okay? Um, the film of the chordates include all those organisms that have a nervous uh, cordon that goes from the head, in the case of, of uh, the humans, from the head along the back all the way to the end, the lower part of the back. That's the uh, vertebral spine, right? 
in our case, but not all of the organisms within the chordate group have a, a, a vertebras, right? They are not vertebrated. They, they can also have a chordate and do not have vertebras. So with, then within the chordates, we have vertebrates, and we could also have organisms without having bones. But within the vertebrates, all the species that we know, uh, for example, fish go into the chordate uh, group, also eels, turtles, sharks, whale, rays, there are many more species that go into the chordate group. So it is important for the students taking the underwater naturalist course to understand how to classify organisms. So we understand what are the main characteristics and also what are the different species that we can find uh, in each of these big groups or categories of, of organisms. Now, once we know how to classify the organisms, we move into the following section, which is how do these organisms interact among each other, right? So we're talking about different, we, during the course, we talk about different uh, interactions that may happen among the different species. For example, we have competence. There are species that compete for a given uh, resource they might be competing for food, but they might also compete for a uh, place, for area, right? Because they need to breed and they need to go in this particular area that has these features that are required for the species to breed, to reproduce. Uh, there might be also predation. This is one that we might be very uh, aware and obviously because of, of the media is exposing and mon uh, let's say showing uh, different ways of predation, especially with carnivores and how they eat all the fish, like, like sharks, like eels, like uh, groupers, snappers, maybe they predate, they eat um, other organisms, right? Predation is not the same as being carnivorous, right? The carnivorous species eat meat, right? But predation is the definition of that interaction in which one species eats another species, right? It can be one vertebrate eating uh, an arthropod, it can be a uh, vertebrate or a chordate eating a sponge, it can be a uh, vertebrate or animal eating a plant, and that's also predation, right? But when the case when you have organisms eating plants, then we call it herbivory instead of predation, right? So uh, when it is to plants, it's called herbivories, um, herbivory, and when it is to other living, moving organisms that are not plants, it's called predation. And then we have uh, the last group of relationships, which is um, symbiosis, right? And symbiosis is basically the relation that happens between two different uh, species, right? So symbiosis can be in three different ways, can happen in three different ways. We have mutualism, which is the, uh, the, the symbiosis in which both of the species, both of the animals being related, being interacting, are going to have a benefit of the relation. For example, you may remember the clownfish and the anemone, right? The anemone provides protection to the clownfish and the clownfish brings food to the anemone. So they both benefit of the relationship. But also we have commensalism. And commensalism is not the same as predation, as most of the people think. Commensalism is basically a relationship in one in, in which one of the species benefits of the relationship, but the other one doesn't get any benefit out of it. Okay, so, and then the last one, we have parasitism, which is the relation in which one of the species gets benefited, but the other one gets damaged or get affected by the relationship, right? In most of the cases, this is an, an imposed relationship when you get infected with a parasite, for example. Okay, so we talk about this relationship, but, but I think the, the more important part after you learn the main concepts and you learn how to classify the organisms is to go in the water and actually try to identify which species relate in what kind of relationship with what other species. And that is going to change completely the way that you watch, that you look and you understand all the organisms that you see when you're diving and you can stay in one single spot after you take this course with me you will dive in one spot for 40 minutes and you will not finish to uh, identify all the possible relationships happening among all the other organisms that you have in one single dive site so this is very very interesting for those of you 
willing to learn more about ecology and how the species relate and what's happening on the ecosystem, why one population declines and one population increases, right? This is going to be very um, uh, interesting to learn as we learn also on the different relationships that happen on the different organisms that coexist in one given area. So talking about relationships, can you uh, or would you identify the different types of relationships that you can see in these photos? For example, on the left corner, we have a flamingo tongue. And I would say the flamingo tongue is predating, right? It's eating the corals that you can see on this uh, fan coral, right? So this is basically the food for the flamingo tongue, but at the same time is a living organism that is being predated by the flamingo tongue. So when we talk about predation, we, we're not just talking about sharks eating fish, right? There's different ways of predation that will happen. Then on the lowest corner on the left, we have a parrotfish that is grassing, right? It's eating algae and they just bite and scrape the surface of, of the corals or the rocks. Uh, and they just take the algae off the rock and, and in some cases with pieces of coral. And this is why <clears throat> Lots of people say that when uh, when parrotfish feed on the coral, they are producing sand because when the, uh, the digestive process has already finished, what they expel from the body is basically pieces of uh, dead coral that is going to be white particles that may form sand, as we know on the Caribbean, for example. Then what would be the relationship on the jellyfish with the different fish? So if we analyze it, and this can be analyzed in different ways, depending on if the fish eat or not from the jellyfish or if the jellyfish, the jellyfish eats the, the fish or not. But let's say these are like traveling together. So it is, this is basically a mutualism relationship in which the, uh, the jellyfish is going to be, get benefited because the small fish are going to clean the jellyfish and going to uh, remove uh, the potential algae that is growing on the jellyfish and is um, not allowing the jellyfish to move. And at the same time, the, the fish are going to be get protected by the jellyfish because jellyfish may be uh, uh, urticants and they can uh, kill sp other species of fish that would fish would uh, eat the, the small fish around it. So it is kind of a mutualism. What would be the relationship of the... Uh, the Christmas tree worms and the uh, and the coral that we see on the center on the lower part. So basically, these are worms that are living within the coral, and they have this tail that comes out. They they are called Christmas tree worms because the tail of the worm look like a, a Christmas tree, right? But they live under the the coral or under the rock in the rock. They dig a hole, right, and they just have the tail out. So basically, they are not affecting the coral, and the coral is not affecting the, uh, the, the worm, the Christmas tree worm. But the Christmas tree worm has a, a, a kind of spine made by, by a stony, uh, how, how you say, like a piece of, of, of shell that goes out, right? It's very sharp. If you touch one of, of those, you can get an injury. So let's say that the coral is benefiting of the uh, Christmas tree worm because there is some kind of protection because of the, of the spine that the, the worms have towards the outside, right? So uh, that can be kind of a commensalism because one species is getting benefited, but the other one is not affected. Then we have, for example, on the right corner on top, we have a, a, a clownfish with what looks like a parasite on the mouth. And this is obviously a parasitism relationship in which the, the clownfish is going to get affected because the clownfish is uh, looking for food and is trying to eat food, but part of that food is going to be eaten by the, the little organism living inside the mouth. So the, the, uh, the food consumption of the clownfish is going to be reduced by the amount of food that the parasite is eating from the food that the clownfish is eating. Uh, collecting, right? It's, it's eating. So this is a kind of uh, parasitism. And what would be the relationship between the remoras and the sharks? 
This is something that has lots of debate and some might, might think that it is parasitism, but basically the remoras are not affecting the shark. The remoras are just uh, getting attached, let's say, to the shark to travel with it, and they can eat from the pieces of the food that the shark is getting that he's not eating or the shark is not eating, right? So they can just eat whatever falls out of the mouth of, of the shark. So it could be a commensalism in which the shark is not affected and the remora get benefited. But it might be in some cases, and you can see lots of videos on the internet of sharks trying to shake all the remoras that they have around them. And this is because it gets to a point in which it is so crowded of remoras, sorry, that, uh, that the shark cannot even swim uh, freely because of all the, the load that he has on top of all the remoras. But those are like extreme cases. I would say that it would be like a commensalism relationship because the shark doesn't get affected that much by the remoras as long as it is one or two or three remoras that are traveling along with, uh, with the shark. So then during the course, we get to this point in which we're going to discuss what's a food web and what's a food chain. So we have under understood already the different relationships that may happen among the different species. So now... We go diving, right? We uh, try to identify as many relationships, uh, relationships as possible. And then we try to make a food web. So we try to figure out who is eating whom and what is being eaten by what other species and where these species exist. So we can kind of make all these lines that you can see on the left, right? This is just a, a, any example, right? But then we can also try to uh, identify or position the different species that we have identified in a given ecosystem according to the level that they have on the trophic chain. And you can see a basic trophic chain here. We have primary producers, which is basically the phytoplankton, and then zooplankton, which are primary consumers that are going to eat the, so the, the phytoplankton, right? And then we have secondary consumers, which is basically small fish that eat the, uh, the zooplankton. And then we have tertiary consumers, and at the end we have the large predators or quaternary consumers, right? And this can get as complex as you can imagine, right? But this is, is just a, a rough idea of how we can uh, classify the organisms according to the level that they use on the trophic chain, right? And also it is important to understand, and this is something we develop on the, on the course, okay, to understand how biomass behaves. So, because you may see that the sharks are the largest, but they are the fewer, right? You don't see that many sharks. But then you have uh, a phytoplankton, which is the tiniest. Actually, they're kind of microscopical in most of the cases, but they are the majority of the biomass that you can find in a given ecosystem. So, uh, this changes completely the way in which we understand the ecosystems, because the small species in large amounts are going to be the more important way of traducing and, and, and converting the energy from the sun in energy in biomass that then gets uh, cascaded through the uh, trophic chain. So this is something also that we apply to diving in, in a given space. So what happens next if we have in these complex uh, webs, trophic webs, when we have invasive species like here in the Caribbean, we have the lionfish that we were talking before. We did a a Facebook Live last week on the lionfish control course that I wrote and Patty has already approved. What happens when you introduce a, uh, an invasive species that was not originally from a given ecosystem that is feeding on different species that have a role in that trophic chain and on the trophic web, right? For example, let's say here the lionfish is eating the small fish that are secondary consumers. So what's going to happen? The primary consumers do not have a predator, so they are going to increase in their numbers. And then the tertiary consumers will not have enough food, so the population of the tertiary consumers are going to drop down. The same will happen with the quaternary consumers. So then it generates an unbalance of, of the trophic chain and the ecosystem. And this is when new populations may uh, increase or populations of different species may increase in a number that is going to produce uh, the uh, declining of a different population and then everything starts going up and down and it is out of order of ecological order just because one invasive species was interrupting the natural processes that actually happen on uh, 
uh, an ecosystem like here in the Caribbean. This is just to give you an example of the things that we talk about during the course and that we go out on the field and we try to identify, understand, and, uh, and, and, and write down, right, the food, cha the, the food chain, the food web, and what's the role of the different um, uh, invasive species, in this case, the lionfish. So then we get to the to the course itself. So this is for all of those for all of those of you that are interested in taking the course. Okay, you need to be an open water diver. Obviously, you need to be ten years old, and then we do at least two dives. But it depends on the interest of the divers. We may do three, four dives, right? And on the richness that we find in a given place, right? So, in all of the dives that we're going to to do, we're going to be working in buoyancy, as you can see, right? Uh, buoyancy is going to be very important as a, as a skill that you should have to be able to watch for periods of time, for extended periods of, of time, watch the organisms uh, in a given site, right? So you have to have very good buoyancy uh, techniques. And then we're going to work on identifying aquatic animals, right? Invertebrates, vertebrates, plants. And we're going to try not only to find the scientific names, but also put them on a trophic chain and a trophic web and try to understand the different relationship, which is what we start doing on the second dive, and we can continue doing in following dives as uh, desired by the students taking the course. Right, so we're going to identify predators, we're going to identify prey, we're going to identify mutualism, commensalism, even we can find some parasitism, and all of that is going to go to the same trophic chain that we were working before so we can have at the end of the course a better understanding of what's happening with all the organism, uh, the organ organisms coexisting in a given site. So this is what the, the course is about. Uh, as you see, it's a very interesting course for those of you who are interested in learning about marine ecology. This is a, a very, very interesting and complete and rounded first step, right? And for those of you that have already some knowledge of, of marine ecology, if you come to us in Rotan Dive Academy, we can help you and build a, a custom program to build on what you have, all the knowledge and the skills that you have already, and maybe we can integrate also some work on the reef restoration that we have here in Roatan, in which we're working in restoring different species of coral. So we have coral trees and we do our planting of corals in different sites in which we also are monitoring different populations of fish. So we understand what's happening with other uh, species within the community, within the ecosystem, where we outplant the coral. So we want to know what's the impact of the new corals that we are outplanting on the overall health of the of the ecosystem of the community of living organisms coexisting in, in a place so with this we have gotten to the end of the of the facebook live of the webinar i hope uh, this uh, ses session has been of your interest remember we're doing these kind of uh, webinars just to use the time efficiently as we are in lockdown or in quarantine and we can refresh or think of what we're going to to do, plan the, the, the next courses that we're going to take when you come down here to Roatan. If you have any questions on the courses that we teach, you can go in our webpage, which is roatandiveacademy.com. As you can see on the, on the document that I have here on the screen, right? You can see the webpage, roatandiveacademy.com. You will find all the information on the ecological courses uh, in that web page and if you have any questions that you want me to answer directly you can write me an email to gopro at roatandiveacademy.com and I will uh, answer any of those questions and also remember that these videos are going to get uploaded to our YouTube channel Roatan Dive Academy so you can download them share them or use them as you want in further uh, studies or dives or t uh, trips that you have around the world so thank you so much for getting to the end of the video and uh, see you soon here in Roatan and in the next Facebook Lives that we're going to be putting out. Thank you so much.